In this video we're going to discuss how to do model selection. For example, when working on a regression problem we have choices to make with respect to the type and amount of basis functions and the amount of regularization. And now you want to know which choice is better than others, right? You want to select the best model. So when you're doing supervised learning, you evaluate errors and you evaluate errors mainly for two reasons. Uh, you want to know uh, how well your model performs in particular on unseen data, because that gives you an impression on how well the model generalizes. Um, but you're also evaluating errors to choose your hyperparameters. For example, you want to choose the optimal parameter for your prior in the maximum posterior case, uh, which we indicated with alpha before, or maybe equivalently, you want to set the right uh, parameter value for lambda uh, in the regularized uh, linear regression case. Okay, so using uh, via these evaluations of errors, we're going to answer mainly two questions. So first of all, how can we estimate the model performance properly for unknown data? And the second question, how can we choose the optimal hyperparameters? All right, so how are we going to do this uh, when we have a particular data set uh, at hand? Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to split our data into three data sets. And how, how you do this precisely is up to you, but typically you, you randomly assign about 80% of your data to the training set. And this uh, training set uh, will be used to automatically optimize your model, right? This data defines the error, which you will minimize, for example, via stochastic gradient descent. So during training, we're, we are going to minimize this error, um, which my model makes with respect to some target value for each of these data points in the training data. And this will uh, give me a particular optimal value for W. So let, let's write this down. So each training procedure, so we minimize the total error, and this gives me an optimal uh, set of parameter values. We, we've seen this before. So these um, W parameters, right? This is, so they, parameter, they parameterize uh, my model. Okay, then we're going to uh, validate these trained models on a separate uh, validation set. So this validation set consists of 10% of of the other data samples and it's important of course that these uh, data samples are not included in the training set right so the model hasn't seen these uh, uh, data points before such that we can make an estimate of the error and get an impression of how well it would generalize and we're mainly going to use this validation set to tune our hyperparameters right because we could train a model um, for for every lambda or for every hyperparameter we could train a model and then we can evaluate how well it performs on this validation set so we repeat this and we uh, in the end we select the most optimal hyperparameter all right so the idea is we train a model uh, with a particular hyperparameter that gives me an error estimate and then we do this again for different hyperparameter settings. Just let me write this down. So we repeat. Okay, and, and this part really, really is the, the model selection part. Okay, so you're training a model for all these different hyperparameters and in the end you select a model that performed, performed best on the validation set. So this, uh, this is the model selection phase. Uh, but in the end, you want to also come up with uh, an error estimate or uh, an idea of how well the model actually generalizes to unseen data. Um, so we're going to use a separate, a final separate test set consisting of the remaining 10% of the data. And you, you need an independent test set, right? Because um, now this validation set became part of my entire model selection uh, framework. So I made choices also based on this validation set. So that could mean that I maybe selectively select the hyperparameters that worked best on the validation set, but it doesn't mean it also generalizes well. So really to get a proper impression of how well uh, the model uh, generalizes, you need to work with an independent test set and and that's the general rule. Whenever you report performance measures and you want them to be accurate, um, they should always be done on a test set, uh, which wasn't seen by the model uh, during training. And with training, I mean like the entire process of coming up with a, a model and selecting both uh, the parameters W as well as the hyperparameters. So this is important. I'm going to stress it again. So we have a final 
test error estimate. So uh, this final test error, uh, because the test set can never be part of model selection. Okay, um, it's clear, remember that, never make this mistake. Now, if you only have a very small data set, then your validation and test sets only consist of very few data points. Uh, so this will probably give you a very noisy estimate of the error. Um, I mean, you could be unlucky and sample a couple of outliers, and this will give you the impression that your model is doing a very poor job, whereas, well, you were just unlucky with your uh, test samples, and the validation set was just not representative enough. But also the other way around, you may uh, sample a couple of, let's say, easy points, and this will give you the impression that you have a very good model, uh, but still it doesn't generalize well because it, it has never seen these uh, complicated cases, uh, let's say. Okay, so to, to, in order to increase the validation set size, we're going to use a trick here, and it's called cross-validation. And what we're going to do is we're going to, to split our full data into k folds. So the data is split into k folds and that looks something like this so we have a full training set let's say we split it in five parts then um, i'm going to train a model five times so each time i select uh, one part for validation so this will not be part of my training procedure um, and then i select the remaining four folds uh, for training and that would give me one of these models one out of these five models uh, we use this notation that each model uh, indexed with minus k uh, means that this model was trained on the entire data set without the k fold. So if you do this k times, then every fold becomes part of the validation set once, but in, in, in each training step, um, each validation set isn't used of training. So this, this, in this way, we, every data point is used at least once for validation. So this would give me a better... Uh, estimate of the error in the end. In the next slide I'm going to make precise how exactly we're going to uh, do this validation. Um, okay, but this is the general uh, recipe. Uh, and then there's of course this number of faults k to choose. Uh, I mean, are, are we going to split it in five parts or 10 or 100? Um, so typically people use the order of five to 10 uh, number of faults. Um, and then of course there's the option of doing a k, k is n, so a leave one out cross validation, really meaning that uh, we are going to use the entire data set for training and only leave one uh, sample out and we're going to validate my model on this one um, data sample. Now let's write down how exactly we're going to do this cross validation. So um, we're going to make use of an indexing function so this function uh, assigns to each data point the corresponding uh, fold uh, in which it was used for validation. So each uh, index is mapped to one out of these k um, numbers. So each k represents one fold. And then we're going to define uh, the cross-validation error as follows. So we're going to take the average of all data points. So the sum i is 1 to n of my error evaluate it like this so what we do here so we're going to evaluate uh, the error for some data point and we're going to select the model uh, which corresponds to uh, the model that didn't use this data point for training so that's why we use this indexing function so let me try to make this clear so for example uh, on the right so you have one a full data set and this particular fold was used for uh, validation and this was used for training. And then in a second uh, data set, this uh, part of the data was used for validation and the green part for training. So this would give me my model um, y minus one. So my first case one fold uh, was left out and this would give me the model y minus 2, where the second fold was left out for training and we're going to use this data uh, for validation. Okay, uh, so we're going to repeat this k times in this example, uh, k is 5, where the red indicates the part used for validation and the green, uh, the data points used for uh, training.
Okay, so in our cross validation, we're going to run over all our uh, data points and each data point uh, is, is here treated as a validation point and we validated using the model um, which didn't use this point for training. So at some point we, we have, for example, this data point xi. So we're going to select the model using this indexing function ki and in this case it would be one, right? Because it, uh, it was the first fault where this was used for validation. And maybe at another point we encounter this uh, data point over here and then my indexing function would select this uh, this particular uh, this particular model uh, to use uh, in the validation step. Okay, so it's clear that with this uh, construction we're going to use each data point at least once in our validation step, and this would give us a more a robust estimate of uh, the prediction error. Um, now we're going to. So this cross-validation can be used for uh, model selection. So that's one task which we're going to use this for model selection, right? So with this, I mean uh, the selection of the optimal hyperparameters, such as, for example, the number of basis functions or um, the regularization uh, factor. But we may also do this to get a, an accurate estimate of the actual model performance. So estimate. Okay, now let's have a closer look at how we would use this in a model selection uh, framework. So our objective would, for example, be to select uh, the best hyperparameter alpha, right? So alpha was a hyperparameter in the maximum a posteriori case. Um, now I can train a model for every possible parameter alpha and every time it will give me a new cross-validation error. And this cross-validation error was given, again, I'm going to write it down, So basically for each fault, for each training set, so I'm going to repeat this k times, I'm going to train a model uh, y alpha, so using this hyperparameter, and I'm going to validate it using uh, the cross-validation error. And then, in, so I'm going to repeat this for every uh, hyperparameter value, so I'm going to test this for all possible alphas, for example, and I'm going to pick the one that gave overall the best uh, cross-validation error. Okay, so let's say I'm going to test, uh, I'm not going to test for all possible values for alpha, but I'm just going to pick an alpha out of uh, two options. So I'm saying I'm going to train my model two, for two values of alpha, and I'm going to, going to select the best alpha. I'm doing the same for a different hyperparameter, let's say beta. And this one will be selected out of three options. Now a beta could be this hyperparameter that models uh, the amount of noise in my data. Then my question to you is, how many times should cross-validation be performed? It is of course two times three, right? Because for every combination of alpha and beta, I have to um, do this cross-validation. Um, and this already tells me that if I have a lot of hyperparameters, then I'm going to have to do this a lot of times. And a way around this is to sort of uh, select them separately, uh, so sort of treat the, these parameters as being independent, uh, which they are not. Uh, but you could do that, first optimize over alpha, fix that one, and then optimize over beta. That could save you some uh, compute. And now let's, let's think about the total number of runs, really the total number of times I actually have to train a model. What would this be? This would, in this case, be six times the number of faults k. So really this whole cross-validation and model selection uh, procedure uh, tends to be quite uh, computationally heavy and people tend to only do this really when your data set is small. Right? That was the whole reason why we moved to cross-validation because if you have a small data set, my uh, validation and test errors are not really reliable, they're, they're quite noisy. So I want to really maximize the amount of uh, data that I have and go to do this via cross-validation. But on the other hand, if you already have a very large data set to start with, then maybe it suffices to, to pick one uh, large enough validation set and one large enough test set, and that would give you a reliable estimate animate, uh, anyway, and this would save you a lot of uh, compute. But again, if you do not have a lot of data, then cross-validation is really the best way to, to get an accurate uh, selection of the hyperparameters, but also an accurate um, impression of the actual um, performance.
Okay, so that was uh, with respect to hyperparameter tuning, but in the end you still have to test it, right? So we, we trained our model and we selected our hyperparameters via cross-validations using this particular, particular data set, but then still if you test it, the test set shouldn't be part of the, your entire pr training procedure. It should be completely independent of what you did before. So you always have to work with this uh, separate test set. Again, <laughs> stress this, evaluate your model always on a held out uh, test set. Uh, but again, now the problem is that this test set could be still be quite small. So that would give you a very noisy estimate of your, um, of your error. So also now, maybe we also want to do some sort of cross validation uh, to get a better uh, estimate of the generalization error. So what we could do now is do nested cross validation. And this looks like this. Now remember that your reported performance measures uh, can never be evaluated on data which was part from, of your training procedure. So that means actual model optimization as well as the hyperparameter selection. So what we're going to do is split our data into these folds. So where one part is used for training and hyperparameter tuning and one part is used for testing. So in this case, this part is used to select an optimal value for alpha and an optimal value for beta. And I'm going to index it with a one because this was done on, um, well, the first uh, fold in my nested uh, cross validation. And then this part is used for testing. So this gives me, uh, well, uh, already one estimate of the generalization uh, error. Now, of course, then I can repeat this for the next fold. So that would give me a new set of hyperparameters of uh, two and beta two. And I'm going to test this on this um, held out uh, test fold. Okay, so now I did this for uh, my second fold and uh, I continue to do so. And in the end, this means that every data point is at least once used for, uh, for, well, for validating the, the generalization error using this test set. So this gives me then in the end a, a more accurate estimation of the, the generalization error. Okay, so the whole point of this whole nested cross-validation was to get a reliable estimate of the generalization performance. Uh, so now if you build a machine learning framework for a customer, for example, um, these test errors that you now computed are quite representative and you say, okay, this is how my model is going to perform. And maybe I add some uncertainty there by looking at the variations uh, among all these uh, test sets. But of course, I also want to deliver the best possible product. So maybe I could still retrain the model that I'm going to deliver using all the data that I have, making a particular choice on the hyperparameters based on the analysis that we just did. Uh, but still, as far as reporting generalization performance goes, the nested cross-validation error is the most accurate thing I can say about it.